The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, we're on set with Kathy Lee Gifford. And I have to remind myself of that every day, too, <laughs> believe me. The Today Show host talks about her passion project. Your children love doing right now when they're little. Mm -hmm. I believe is what they're meant to do. And the gift she wants to give. Let's stop making our kids go there when it's God already has a plan for their life that is already beautiful for them. Plus, an addict who started popping her dad's pills and then turned to smoking meth. It makes you feel like it's the, the missing link. Nothing compares to that feeling, that rush. Her path back to life. That's the spirit of death that you're wearing all over yourself. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Former Attorney General Jeff Sessions is barely out the door, and already pressure is mounting on the acting Attorney General to recuse himself in the Russia investigation. Not surprisingly, it's Democrats emboldened by their wins in the House turning up the heat. At the same time, we're learning the Russia investigation may soon be wrapping up. Jennifer Wishon is in Washington with more. Robert Mueller is reportedly writing his final report on the Russia investigation that's cast a cloud over the Trump administration. The president is expected to send written answers to Mueller's questions by the end of the month. This as his acting attorney general Matt Whitaker assumes control of the probe. But Democrats are calling on Whitaker to recuse himself because of his past comments about the investigation. I could see a scenario where Jeff Sessions is replaced uh, with a recess appointment and that attorney general doesn't fire Bob Mueller, but he just reduces his budget so low that his his investigation grinds to an absolute almost a halt. Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee say Deputy AG Rod Rosenstein should continue oversight of the Mueller investigation. They also sent a letter telling the Justice Department to preserve all materials related to any investigations by the special counsel's office and the departure of Attorney General Sessions. Former Justice official Ian Pryor tells CBN News Whitaker should expect ongoing attacks. The biggest challenge for him is really going to be that, that the knives are out from, from Democrats. I mean, they are going to go after him, and you're seeing it already. With or without a recusal, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle say Mueller's investigation should proceed without interference, with Republicans adding it's gone on too long and Democrats applying the most heat. It would create a constitutional crisis if this were a prelude to ending or greatly limiting the Mueller investigation. I don't say it's a constitutional crisis quite yet, but it's a perilous time. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham says there's no need for concern. To those who worry about the Mueller investigation, you need not worry, he'll be allowed to finish his job. And we're learning more about Whitaker's worldview. During a 2014 debate in Iowa when he ran for the Republican nomination for Senate, Whitaker reportedly said he'd like to see federal judicial nominees be people of faith with a biblical view of justice. Under the law, Whitaker can remain acting AG for seven months. Among those the White House is considering to serve as Sessions' permanent replacement, former New Jersey governor and Trump supporter Chris Christie. People close to him say if offered the job, he'll consider it seriously. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Well, welcome to the new normal in Washington, D.C. We're going to see investigation and after investigation. Uh, the House has been literally gift wrapped this one. And that note they sent will preserve everything uh, in, in law practice. That's called a litigation hold. And it um, puts on the other party, you have to have a preservation policy right now to make sure nothing is destroyed. If anything is, then we're going to hold you accountable for it. Uh, this has gotten just unbelievably strange. Uh, and we'll, we'll be watching every minute of, it, minute of it. But guaranteed, once the Democrats are in position in, in January, this is going to be the very first investigation. Why did Sessions uh, resign? Why did he leave the administration? Uh, why was Whitaker put in, in, in his place? Uh, what is the underlying reason for that? Uh, and then the ongoing pressure for Whitaker to recuse himself. We're going to see that drum beat uh, from now until whenever Mueller wraps up his investigation. Uh, the sooner, the better. 
Well, in other news, the investigation continues into the deadly bar attack in California. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? Well, Gordon, federal investigators are working to learn more about the Marine combat veteran who shot and killed 12 people inside a country bar in Thousand Oaks, California. Authorities are searching the home of 28-year-old Ian Long, hoping to find a motive behind Wednesday's rampage. Ventura County Sheriff Sergeant Ron Helis rushed in to help, but was shot and killed. He'd plan on retiring next year after 29 years with the force. Sergeant Helis was having a conversation with his wife on the phone, as he does several times during the shift, and said to her, hey, I got to go handle the call. I love you. I'll talk to you later. He went in there to save people and made the ultimate sacrifice. Hundreds of people attended a vigil Thursday night to mourn the victims. Well, Florida Republican Governor Rick Scott is suing two Florida counties, accusing election supervisors of what he calls rampant fraud in vote counting in his bid for the U.S. Senate. Scott ordered the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to immediately investigate Broward and Palm Beach counties. This as new ballots pouring in have narrowed Scott's lead over incumbent Democrat Senator Bill Nelson. Scott said, quote, he will not sit by while unethical liberals try to steal this election. Meanwhile, in the Arizona Senate race, Democrat Kirsten Sinema has pulled ahead of Republican Martha McSally by about 10,000 votes. Voters turned out in historic numbers on Election Day, and no one group was more important for Republicans than evangelicals. Mark Martin has more. Well, God plays a big factor in my life. The God factor was front and center. In a congressional race that saw presidential levels of voter turnout across the country, evangelical Christians showed up in droves. Faith and Freedom Coalition Chairman Ralph Reed attributes that surge to the president. The evangelicals delivered this vote in a big way, and of course Donald Trump deserves an enormous amount of credit. The faith-based vote surged to include more than one out of every three voters in Tuesday's elections. Evangelicals made up 26 percent of the national electorate, and of those, 80 percent voted for Republicans, with only 12 percent going for Democrats. But the real evangelical impact was felt on a state level, where in states that flipped seats from Democrat to Republican, the evangelical electorate surpassed the national average every time. There are a couple people looking down from heaven I want to recognize. In Florida, where an emotional Rick Scott claimed victory in his bid for the Senate, 30 percent of all voters were evangelicals, and 80 percent of those Christians voted for Scott. And we have a narrow window. In Indiana, where Republican Mike Braun won his Senate bid, evangelical turnout topped the national average by 14 percent, and 71 percent cast their votes for Braun. Without you, I'm nothing, and with you, I'm everything. Similar evangelical numbers helped sweep in Senator-elect Kevin Kramer in North Dakota. The good Lord and the people of Missouri have given us the victory. And Republican Senate winner Josh Hawley, a Christian evangelical candidate CBN News has been following since the beginning of his Senate run in Missouri. The country needs us. The culture needs us. Our society needs us. We're the ones who have to step forward and to bring the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ into every corner of our society. It's our mission. It's our duty. It's also our great privilege. It's a tremendous, tremendous privilege. He told us his faith drives his politics. The Lord has called us uh, to do our part in the public sphere to stand for him and to stand for the principles on which this country was founded. And as I see it, my job is to be faithful to those things and to leave the rest to the Lord. Before the election, Christian leaders called on the faithful to be good citizens not only by praying for our leaders, but also by voting for them at the polls. This election shows when they show up, it makes a difference. Mark Martin, CBN News. Thanks, Mark. Well, turning overseas, in Japan, Christianity is a minority faith and the church is small. But CBN Superbook is now in its second month on air in Japan and gaining popularity. Recently, the program took center stage at a large evangelistic event for kids and their families. Lucille Toulousen brings us this report from Tokyo. This is known as the Joy Joy Festival. It's Japan's largest annual evangelistic event, organized by 88 churches and the Word of Life Press Ministries, which is Superbook's ministry partner here. 2,000 kids and their families attended, and half of them are not part of any church. Churchgoers grabbed this opportunity to invite non-Christians to the concert, not only for entertainment, but to hear the good news about God's love. 
A special attraction this year was Superbook's Gizmo, or Robic, as he is known in Japan. The audience got even more excited when they received Superbook DVD sets. Gizmo is very happy meeting new friends here at the Joy Joy Festival, where Superbook has also participated. This is a great way to promote Superbook that now airs on national television here in Japan. John Tan, CBN Regional Director for Japan, describes the airing of Superbook as a miracle and a great favor from God. There was a difficulty to get uh, religious or Christian material on air. But seeing Superbook, uh, the quality of animation, and it helps children, so then they've allowed us to be on air. In addition to watching Superbook on television, churches are using the animated Bible series as part of their Sunday school curriculum. One of the big issues for the youth is they don't have hope. They don't know what to do with the future. But we know the church has the real hope in Christ. The lesson I learned from Superbook is to put Jesus first in everything I do. I love the part of the resurrection after Jesus died on the cross. Because Jesus is the one who forgave our sins and died on the cross. I invite my friends to our home to watch Superbook. I hope they tell their mothers about Superbook so they can get to know Jesus. Lucille Talusan, CBN News, Tokyo. Thanks, Lucille. Gordon, a lot of smiling faces there at Tokyo's Joy Joy Festival. Oh, a lot of smiling faces right here because what an answer to prayer, what, an, what a dream come true. Superbook started in Japan back in the early 1980s, and to see it back again on air and doing remarkably well in the ratings. It's a, it's a real joy for me. If you want to be a part of it, be a part of taking the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. Here's Japan uh, with a p Christian population in the low sing single digits, uh, know nothing about Christianity, know nothing about the stories of the Bible. What a joy it is to bring those stories to them on television. And you can be a part of all of it. You can be a part of the production. You can be a part of the distribution. You can be part of the translation. How? Join the Superbook Club. And for a gift of $25 or more, we'll send you the latest episode, which is the story of Jeremiah. Uh, it's a thrilling episode. It's an episode for our day, the need for, for repentance and a return to God. It's yours when you call us. 1-800-700-7000. And all you have to do is say, yes, I want to be a part of the Superbook Club. Here's my gift of $25 or more. Terry? Well, up next, Ephraim Graham traveled to the Today Show to talk with Kathy Lee Gifford about her new children's book. What your children love doing right now when they're little, mm -hmm. I believe is what they're meant to do. Hear how Kathy Lee is inspiring children to find God's unique plan for their lives after this. Well, entertainer Kathy Lee Gifford says that what she came out of the womb wanting to do is what she spent her entire life doing, putting on shows. And she believes that what kids love doing right now is the key to what they will want to be doing in the future. In her fourth book for children, Kathy Lee encourages little ones to realize the unique plan God has for their lives. And when she talked with our Ephraim Graham on the Today Show set in New York City, she also had a word for parents. Yeah, by the way. From making television, my character Annabelle ends up here and meets Craig Ferguson's character. To making oh, movies, gonna love me to death. To yeah, making music, one. Kathy Lee Gifford keeps busy entertaining. I just know that what I came out of the womb wanting to do is what I've spent my entire <laughs> life doing. Absolutely, putting on shows. <laughs> And nobody could have interested me in a, in a science project or a, a math equation. I, w I wasn't going to go there. Let's stop making our kids go there when it's God already has a plan for their life that is already beautiful for them. Inspiring little ones to find God's beautiful plan for them is at the heart of her latest work. The gift that I can give is Gifford's fourth children's book. Its poetic pages read, Maybe my gift is just to be kind by taking care of the stray animals I find. And could my gift be a wonderful thing, like having the talent to dance and sing? We sat down with Kathy Lee in New York City on the set of NBC's Today Show 
to discuss this passion project. What your children love doing right now when they're little, mm -hmm. I believe is what they're meant to do. Yeah. Did you see that in your own children? Yes, totally, Wow. completely. Both of them are excellent writers. My son now got his master's degree from Oxford University in screenwriting, and he's got like seven projects <laughs> going in Hollywood right now. You can't stop him. Mm -hmm. Cassidy wanted to be an actress, and she was a tiny little girl, and she's done nine movies, new series coming out. She's, they're doing what they, they love doing, and I don't want my children to do what I want them to do. I want them to do what they want to do. You know, we hover too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we've raised them in the way they should go, then we need to release them to soar on the wings of the wind with the Lord, yeah. not keep holding them on, you know, and making them into what we want. Yeah. God's got a better plan for our children than we do. I love the way the book even begins, essentially saying that, I, I, as I'm reading it, I hear the scripture, you're fearfully and wonderfully, wonderfully made. Right. Like, there's no one like you. The uniqueness, you. exactly. You. Yeah, I think there's a tendency in our world to cookie cutter people. Mm -hmm. I went to, uh, at the different places in my life where people wanted me to just fit into the mold. I don't think we're supposed to, 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 to um, uh, fall into place. I think we're supposed to stand out, really. But if God went to so much trouble to make um, snowflakes individual, not one snowflake out of the gazillions and gazillions of them is alike mm -hmm. under a microscope then we certainly are the, 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 the masterpiece of his creation is the human being. Mm -hmm. Then, then, and the first letter in unique is the word you, or the letter you, yeah. mm -hmm. the letter you. And we tell children that at an early age, they, that builds up, wow, I'm that special to God that he went to so much trouble to make me, make me special so I can do special things in this world. Mm -hmm. Not so I can win Grammys, not so I can have a lot of money in the bank. Those things may happen, yeah. but they'll happen as a byproduct of you following God's path for your life. At the same time, the fierce army of the Philistines. The biblical story of young David defeating Goliath inspired Kathy Lee's children's musical, The Little Giant. And now this book. There's a song in it at the very end called, What is Your Stone? Mm -hmm. And that's basically the question we should be asking our children, not what do you want to be when you grow up, just yeah. what has God already made you to be? So grab your stone and throw it well. One of the underlying messages or maybe the greatest theme in this is finding your gift is not just for you, it's really for those around you. That's right, it isn't for us. We live in a me, me, me generation. We live in a where's mine generation. I'm entitled to this, I'm entitled to that. We're not entitled to anything. Even the breath we breathe every moment of our day is a gift from God. And we should be grateful. We should be grateful people, not entitled to people. And I have to remind myself of that every day too, believe me. <laughs> there are a few do. people in this room that spent a lot of years with me and they're going, mama, don't preach. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and, and even if you're not, the smartest person you know. If you're not the most beautiful person you've ever laid eyes on, if you're not the, you don't fit into certain molds, that's praise God, because you're not supposed to. But here's the thing, there is one thing that every single one of us can give, and that's the way our book ends, uh, no matter what your circumstances are. And that is the gift of God's love. You can give a smile, children understand that. You can, you can have a lemonade stand and help a family that's been falling on hard times in your own neighborhood. Start there, mm -hmm. start, start in little ways. Let God show you a need in the world and then let them lead you to a way to help people with that. You can rescue animals. You can be a, a good player on a team yeah. and, and, and give the ball to somebody else when you know you could make it over the finish line. That kid's never made it over the finish line. Let them have it. Yeah. Those kinds of things. It's, it's really quite a simple message. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those are the ones we, we, we trip over. Kathy Lee is living that giving message with her book, donating the proceeds to Child Help, a nonprofit organization working to prevent and treat victims of child abuse. Ephraim Graham, CBN News, New York. It's a lovely book with a lovely idea. Kathy Lee Gifford's book is called The Gift That I Can Give. It's really pretty. I think your kids would enjoy it. It's available wherever books are sold. Great message. Well, up next, a young troubled woman starts shooting up. It makes you feel like it's the, the missing link. Like it's the piece to your puzzle that you've been searching for your whole life. It is so overwhelming and strong and nothing compares to that feeling, that rush. See where that rush leads her right after this.
At 16 years old, Jennifer Wuerl shut down her emotions after the dad she adored was paralyzed in a car accident. She also turned her back on God. A few years later, Jennifer was finally able to feel something again, the rush of shooting up heroin. He was the leader of our family. He was 6'5", 250 pounds, strong, could pick all three of us up at the same time. And he went from that, you know, to gone. The news had been staggering for Jennifer. The 16-year-old had just come from a missions trip, only to find her dad in a wheelchair, the victim of a car accident that would leave him paralyzed for life. I felt numb. I avoided the hospital at all costs. I, I felt like if I just don't deal with this, maybe it's not happening. The trip had inspired Jennifer to go into the missions field. Now, she questioned everything she believed about a loving God. I thought, really? If this is what you're gonna give your, your children who love you and who are trying to do good for you, then I don't want anything to do with you. Jennifer's mother started drinking heavily leaving her three daughters to find ways to cope on their own. She wasn't there for us. She was a nervous, worrisome, anxiety-driven wreck. As for Jennifer, she stopped going to church altogether and took to drinking with friends. But she poured most of her time and energy into school. So that became my focus. It was a perfectionism-driven, I'm going to succeed and achieve now. Her efforts got her a scholarship to Rutgers, where she continued to succeed. Then, just before graduation, her parents divorced, and she went to live with and care for her dad. She graduated, but her occasional drinking became a regular ritual. I didn't want to feel pain. I didn't want to cry over my dad. I didn't want to cry over my family. I didn't want to feel that loss and that pain, so I just covered it up. Then, her younger sister moved in just off a stint in drug rehab. Unwilling to give up her habit, she dragged Jennifer down into her world of addiction. She quickly convinced me to start sneaking into my dad's room at night and taking his synthetic heroin, Oxycontin. Jennifer started shooting up heroin and eventually meth. It makes you feel like it's the, the missing link. Like it's the piece to your puzzle that you've been searching for your whole life. It is so overwhelming and strong and Nothing compares to that feeling, that rush. For six years, Jennifer moved around going from job to job, having run-ins with the law and fighting addiction. I was running from God. Little pieces of me started to fade away and I became completely numb, desensitized to anything going on around. During that time, she made several attempts to rehab. So there would be moments when I would kind of snap out and be like, this is not what I want for my life. I did have a desire to get married and be a mom and have my own family someday. While Jennifer was willing to go into rehab, she dismissed any notion of asking God for help. Why didn't I think Jesus would fix me at any point in my using years? Because I didn't think he was good. I didn't think he loved me enough to pick up the broken pieces and put me back together. I was broken and I didn't think he could make me whole. At 26 years old, addicted and out of work, Jennifer had run out of options. Really hit another bottom, a low, low. Tired of life, tired of using, tired of not having money, tired of being in a fog, tired of not feeling well physically, tired of being scared. A year earlier at her older sister's wedding, one of Jennifer's aunts told her about a healing ministry in Georgia. At the time, Jennifer didn't give it much thought. Now, it seemed like her only hope. When I got there, I had skulls. Skulls on my shirt, skull rings, black dyed hair. I remember someone approaching me and saying, that's the spirit of death that you're wearing all over yourself. I sat in on that first session and felt the Holy Spirit for the first time in a long time and God saying, your time is up. It's you and me now, and I've missed you, and you're my daughter, and I want you back. For a week, Jennifer learned about God's love and power. She filled her notebook with teaching that transformed her life. I broke down and I sobbed 
so hard, uncontrollably sobbing. And ladies came around and laid hands and hugged me and comforted me. And I honestly feel like I had demons from all of my drug abuse and that they were released in that prayer. Jennifer recommitted her life to Christ, was baptized and completely delivered from drugs. She returned home to New Jersey to serve time for a previous drug charge. In jail for three months, she learned more about God. That's when I fell in love with Jesus again. It started in, in Georgia, but in jail, locked up, nothing else to do, confined, I felt free. I felt like life was gonna start. When I got out, the world was my oyster, like, let's go, I'm back. Once out of jail, Jennifer moved to Florida with her mother and within three months met her husband, Jason. On her wedding day, her dad was by her side giving her away. Today, she is the mother of two happy girls. When I look in the mirror, I think of God's faithfulness. I was trying to fill the hole in my heart and the broken pieces from life with the world. But only the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit can fill that. So he filled that in me, and I find refuge in that and comfort, and I'm full. Now, I don't care who you are. Life is full of curveballs for all of us. Things happen, things that are unexpected, things that we're unprepared for, things that are painful and hurtful. And, you know, our tendency so that we can survive and move on is just to stuff things down inside of us and say, I'm just going to keep moving and also to put up a wall so no one and nothing can hurt us or touch us in the same way again. What we don't realize is we become our own enemy in that process. Jennifer talked early on about looking for the missing piece of the puzzle. Well, maybe today you're feeling burned out on your life. You're feeling like you've tried it all, like you're not willing to surrender your heart, open up your life to more hurt, more pain, to being vulnerable. But I want to tell you, Jesus is the missing piece of your puzzle. And while you may be feeling that, you have no idea what you're shutting out by the wall that you've built. It's a wall of your own making, and the only way to tear that down is to come to the end of yourself. You know, they say in AA, you get help when you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. So today, if you're feeling hopeless and lonely and lost, are you sick and tired of feeling sick and tired? Because Jesus is available all the time, every day, any place, anywhere. There's nothing you can do that will make you unacceptable to him. In fact, as he said to Jennifer, he's waiting on you. Maybe this is the day where God's saying to you, you know what, your time is up. You've been running, running, running. And now it's time for you to give me the same chance you've given everything else. God loves you so much. He sees you. He sees the mess that we're in. You know, when, when we're parenting children and they get messy or they get wounded or they get hurt, we just scoop them up and love them the way that they are. We don't say, okay, go get yourself together, clean yourself up, and then you and I can talk about what our relationship's going to be. God is a good father. He loves you just the way you are, right where you're at. You're at. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. C.S. Lewis says he's not safe, but he's good. It doesn't mean that you're never going to have another hurt in your life, another disappointment, but it means he's going to walk through it with you. He's going to give you everything you need, not just to walk through it, not just to survive it, but to be victorious in the midst of it. You can't do that on your own. So ask Jesus right now, just put your pride down, put your hurt and your pain behind you, surrender your heart. Come to him and just pray this with me right now. Jesus, I have run and run and run from you and I am exhausting myself. Today I'm coming to you and I'm saying, please come into my heart. Please come into my life, forgive my sins as you've promised you will, as far as the East is from the West. It's hard for me to understand your love, God, but today I just want to receive it. I need you. I want you. And I'm asking you today to take my past, my hurt, my pain, my sin. I'm laying it on the altar before you. Will you make something that matters out of it? Will you give eternal significance to it because I'm giving it to you in all its ugliness and all of its hopelessness? 
I'm asking you, Jesus, to apply your word, Romans 8, 28, that you will take all things that the enemy has meant for evil and you will work them for good in my life. I give you my life today in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you've just prayed that prayer, then the adventure has begun for you. This is what you were created for. This is not something you do lightly. You've come to the end of yourself. Now invest yourself in him. How do you do that? Well, we've provided for you a new day. It's filled with a brochure, a CD. Talks to you about how do you grow in your relationship with God. This is free. So is the phone call to get it. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I just prayed that prayer and I'd like the new day packet. We will get this out to you right away. Gordon? Well, still ahead, a baby is abandoned in a box. See how she's rescued and receives hope for a happy future. That's coming up right after this. And welcome back to the 700 Club. The Trump administration will no longer hear asylum claims by migrants who enter the country illegally. In the past, those who reached American soil had the right to stay while officials evaluated their bid for asylum. An executive order issued Thursday says those seeking asylum make their claims at a recognized point of entry or be deported. The new policy is anticipation of the migrant caravan making its way to the southern border. Operation Blessing is helping provide education for children in Kenya. Children of the Maasai tribe live miles from civilization, making it difficult for them to go to school. Operation Blessing stepped in and built a brand new school right in their village. In addition to education, the school guarantees each child receives a healthy meal and instruction in hygiene. Operation Blessing also brought learning supplies and provides a safe water source. You can learn more about Operation Blessing by going to its website, ob.org. Gordon and Terry are back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Well, we have a Robertson family tradition, and that tradition is whatever you're going to spend on Thanksgiving, on Christmas Eve dinner, on Christmas dinner, uh, take an equivalent amount of money and give it to those who don't have anything. How, how can we help people in need, and it's a wonderful way to celebrate Christmas. And the whole family can get involved in this gift to say, yes, we're going to help others in their time of need. Now, for a gift of $25 or more, we'll also have something really special for you. Aaron Zimmerman has directed and produced a wonderful documentary on Christmas traditions. And how did we get the very um, traditions that we celebrate? How, why do we put a Christmas tree in our house? Uh, how did December 25th become the date? Uh, we, we go from Finland to a Santa village in Finland to a live nativity in Italy where uh, St. Francis started live nativities about 800 years ago. You find all of it out in this wonderful documentary. And then a special bonus is my father reading a Christmas carol. All for you if you give us $25 and we'll take that gift and we'll help people in need. So 1-800-700-7000 if you want to be a part of it. Terry? Well, Hope has lived at a children's home supported by Orphan's Promise her entire life. She was abandoned there in a box shortly after she was born. But don't feel sorry for this little girl. She's full of life, laughter, and love. All thanks to people just like you. Hope is a happy and adventurous young girl. I love exploring. Sometimes I go out to pick flowers and come home to share them with my friends. She lives at Brenda's Hope, a children's home supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. When she was a baby, one of the older girls found her abandoned in a box just outside the home. Brenda has taken care of her ever since. I believe God sent her to me so I could be her mother. I watched her grow and heard her first words. She was nameless when we found her abandoned. I called her Hope. I believe her birth mother hoped her baby would have a better future with us than she could provide. This is my home. I know I am safe here. Mama Brenda takes care of me. I call her mommy because I know she will always love me. I am so happy to be here. 
Hope is one of 90 children who live at the home. We provide them with a place to stay, with food, clothes, education, and everything else they need. The most rewarding thing for me is to give each of them hope and to show them that God will always be with you. I want to grow up and be a good girl. I know God will always provide for me. I want to thank you for your help. Without you, none of this would be possible. Thank you, CBN, for loving us and for supporting us. Brenda is an amazing mom to all of her children, and it's a privilege to work with her. She's appropriately named this little girl Hope because that's what Orphan's Promise tries to do in places that we serve all around the world. You know, children without hope, well, really anyone without hope, adults as well, but for children especially, they stop dreaming. They don't have a vision for their future. When they have a place to belong, did you hear what Hope said? This is my home. I know I'm safe here, and I know Mama Brenda will love me always. Giving that kind of gift to a child, a place to belong, an identity for who they are, and then teaching them the love of Christ is the answer to it all. Thank you for helping us help orphaned and vulnerable children around the world. Orphans Promises CBN's outreach to those children, and we couldn't do it without you. So we're asking you today to help us with what we do. Our number's toll free. You can give to Orphan's Promise by calling 1-800-700-7000. And our way of saying thank you is to send you miraculous blessings. This is an amazing teaching by Pat on how to line yourself up with the blessing of God. Who doesn't want to do that? I know I do and I think you do too. And there's some amazing testimonies in here. So support the work of CBN around the world. It's really making a difference in the lives of millions of people. And we say thank you in advance. Gordon? Well, coming up, a new film designed to launch a movement. This is a story about faith and family and about the idea that when we come together, the unthinkable can happen. Actor and director Aaron Wolf talks about restoring tomorrow when we come back. In our divided nation, what can we agree on? Well, that question is raised in a new film from actor and director Aaron Wolf called Restoring Tomorrow. Take a look. Is there anything we can agree on? I think the answer is actually yes. On November 13th, we are having an incredibly special event with the film Restoring Tomorrow. You'll follow my journey as I come back to my place that mattered. And together we'll have this movement of Restoring Tomorrow for everyone all around the country. And guess what? That's something that cuts through the divide and brings us all together. And that's what we need to do is find the things that we have in common. Just like this, our childhood bedrooms. We all have places that matter. This is a story about faith and family and about the idea that when we come together, the unthinkable can happen. I hope you'll join me on November 13th as we show the film Restoring Tomorrow. Afterwards, you'll see something truly remarkable. You'll see a discussion where we all get along. Together, we can find our childhood bedrooms and our childhood places that matter to us. Well, please welcome to the 700 Club, the director of Restoring Tomorrow, Aaron Wolf. And Aaron, it's great to have you here. It's so great to be here. This film is very personal to you. Why? It is as personal as can be. It started with a bump in the road. I was supposed to get married and a month before the wedding got called off. And I thought, oh man, this was so, I was so depressed. And then my rabbi asked me, said, uh, I came in and he said, can you start chronicling what we're trying to do here? Restore this place that's falling apart. And so I did, and about six months in, I started to feel that connection again, that connection to my faith, to my family. My grandfather was a, a rabbi, and I went on this journey and I realized that I think I'm serving as a microcosm what, for what can happen to any younger person in our country and how it's so important to come back to that place. Well, why do you say that? Why, why is it so important to come back to that? 
when we come back to our places that matter, when we come back to our churches, to our temples, all of a sudden we're connecting to good so that we can then go, because the building is the building, but what happens in that building is what makes us who we are so then we can go out and make the world a better place. And it's a big message that you'll see in the movie and in the movie at the end, I think you'll be caught off guard with, uh, without a spoiler alert with what, uh, with what happens. All right. Well, grandsons of rabbis aren't supposed to go away. Um, so what, what happened to you along the way? I went to New York to, to NYU, to the mm -hmm. uh, film and acting school, and just became caught up in being a 19, 20, 21 year old. And then what I started to learn is just how amazing my grandfather it was, what he did. The man came at 19 years old from Nazi ruled Germany. And I think there's a picture of him uh, in the forest practicing Judaism. He came to United States because as he said, this is the most beautiful yeah, country. The there. there he is, because th this is the most beautiful country in the world. He arrived at Ellis Island mm -hmm. for freedom. And what he always said, he was all about interfaith. And what he said to me growing up, and it's why I appreciate him more now than ever, unfortunately he's no longer with us, is he was doing something that I think is more relevant today than ever, bringing people together, uniting people, letting people feel this faith, this family, and restoring tomorrow for us and for everyone. So tell me about the film. Uh, what, what does it chronicle? It chronicles the journey of this temple from the 1860s, from when Abraham Lincoln was president all the way to the present day. It also shows other places of worship and it shows my journey, my personal journey and how I reconnected to my faith. And what I hope, it's Tuesday, November 13th, that it's gonna be in theaters across the country. And with all of the pointing fingers that's going on right now in our country, I hope we can reach out our hands instead and stop the hate and start the hope and so there's a synagogue in L.A. Yes. From 1860. Yes. It started when the L.A., the population, guess what? Guess how much? 20,000? 5,000. 5,000. 5,000 people. And so it shows how this synagogue has been a fly on the wall throughout the history of our country. And what it also shows is how it needs to be in places like it need to be flies on the wall for the next hundred years. And we as younger Americans, as younger leaders in our community need to be those voices for the future because as we say in the movie we are the ancestors for the future and the more that we can promote this hope and promote this idea of family and that's why I want people to bring their grandparents I want you to go on November 13th with your families and you'll see at the end I think you'll feel something truly special and connect again I, I just find it really unusual there's a synagogue in LA from 1860 and it's absolutely spectacular. I mean, this is a synagogue of synagogues. This yes. is a beautiful place. Why does it go into disrepair? What happened to the synagogue that it, it declined? There's uh, two words that come to mind, complacency and neglect. Complacency from my generation and neglect because of that. So all of a sudden, you're losing a place that is so important. And we just had uh, an event. Uh, I was at uh, Shabbat services there. And the event was so powerful because it was about the hate crimes that have been going on. And there were people of all religions on the stage together, uniting as one. And that's what places like this stand for. They're the places we want to go to when, when it matters most, when things are tough, when times are tough, when bumps in the road happen. And we need to have these places and preserve them. And it's our duty as younger Americans to make sure that they're alive for a hundred years to come. And that's the message is let's preserve it. Let's preserve it for our faith, for our family and for the future of our country. Uh, you can't talk about synagogues in America today without saying the word Pittsburgh. And it's unfortunate a whole city has become now you just say Pittsburgh and, and your mind immediately goes to the shooting in the synagogue. It's, it's why, um, you know, I wish my grandfather was here because he'd have better words than me. But You're I, doing great. You've got well, great words. I, uh, when I, well, Pittsburgh, the moment that happened, I said, you know what we need to do? This is a movement now. And on Tuesday, November 13th, I want to raise money to help the victims' families of all the hate crimes that have been going on. And Pittsburgh 
stands out, now Thousand Oaks. And we need to do that. And so we're giving a portion of the proceeds to the victims of hate because the America that my grandfather came to in that picture when he's on Ellis Island is not the America of going and shooting up places of worship. They're called sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. They're called sanctuaries. They're called churches. They're these places that are, that are sacred. And the idea that, that our own people are shooting them up, that's not the America he came to from Nazi-ruled Germany, a place with the most hate. He came to America for freedom and for hope. And that's what our movie is doing. On Tuesday, around the country, we can feel hope together. You're talking about inspiring a movement. What, what, what do you want the movement to do? You know, I want people to go in thinking they're seeing a movie, mm -hmm. and then afterwards we've created a special piece. Mm -hmm. And then I want them to go out to their community and embrace one another and go back to your place of faith, even your church, your temple, or even if you think you're atheist or something, still go back, check it out, try it out. Because when you go in and when you feel that energy, you're gonna go out and feel better about the world. And to me, that's a movement. If we all start restoring our tomorrows, we all can make the world a better place and stop some of this from happening. I love that phrase, even if you think you're an atheist. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. Well, the film is called Restoring Tomorrow. It's a one night only Fathom event, so that you get one shot at this. It's on Tuesday, November 13th. To find a theater, we've got the listing on CBN.com, uh, and we can refer you over to the website. Here's a word from Psalms. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God bless you, we'll see you again.